Hi, welcome back to my channel. Now, over Christmas, I did some readings from some ghost stories, which seemed to be quite popular. So I thought it might be quite a good idea to share my favourite ghost story and horror writers, particularly in the short story format, which I've always loved. And uh, I thought I'd go through them and share them with you. And uh, not all of the best ghost story writers, just the ones that have touched me most and haunted me most. Now, I've got to start with the master, the maestro, Edgar Allan Poe. I fell in love with Edgar Allan Poe from a very young age through this book, which is an abridged form of some of his most famous tales. It has The Telltale Heart, The Castle of Montiado, and The Fall of the House of Usher. And immediately I fell in love with these kind of queasy, intense, feverish stories that Poe wrote. Later on, as a student, I studied Poe more fully. I got hold of this, The Complete Tales and Poems, and I ended up writing my university dissertation on Edgar Allan Poe. And I became fascinated by two aspects of Poe's writing. The thing is that Poe was completely obsessed with margins, and particularly two margins. What's the margin between sanity and insanity? So many of the narrators of his stories, they're constantly trying to tell you that they're sane. And each time, what they do is they say, I'm very sane. I'm not mad. I've got senses. I can, I can see things that other people can't see. I can hear things that other people can't hear. My eyesight is very, you know, susceptible to the, just the merest light or the merest sound. It's as though for Poe, the greatest amount of rationalism or use of the senses brings you closer and closer to insanity, like the uh, Roderick Usher and like the narrator of so many of his stories, and he's constantly, like, picking a, a scab, you know, or a wound on the flesh. He keeps picking at this idea, what's the difference between sanity and insanity? And when you look at Poe's life, he had a very strange life, Poe. You know, he married his 13-year-old cousin, he disappeared for days before his death, no one knows where he was. He was a, an inveterate gambler, I think he was kicked out of the army because he was a gambler. There's a sense that this is a man who's kind of living just about in the world of civility, and any moment he could drop. And there's that sense of feverish intensity, jagged, you know, uh, sense in his writing. That, you know, Poe is not a smooth writer. He's very jagged and jangly, and he jumps up and down, and his sentences go in and out in, a, in attack. And the other margin that Poe explores is the margin between life and death. Um, I'm not sure if this is an apocryphal story or not, but apparently Poe suffered, like many people, um, from catatonia. He would sometimes go into a catatonic trance, and he, would, he had a lifelong terror of being buried alive, which he immortalises in his story, The Premature Burial. And um, he's constantly looking at where does life stop and where does death begin? So in one of his best stories, Manuscript found in a bottle. He is this story about this guy on a ship and he, his ship crashes into another ship and he's thrown into the ocean and he goes on board this other ship and this ship is a kind of ghostly vessel crewed by the dead and it sort of sails, you know, noiselessly across the ocean. So obviously this man has entered the realm of the dead but he doesn't, he's not quite there yet. And then at the end of the story, the ship starts to spiral down into this maelstrom. And Poe almost kind of ludicrously, farcically, is playing with the moment when the guy can throw the bottle out and the manuscript can be saved to be read in the world of the living. And the whole of the last paragraph is about this moment, this moment, this moment, right now. And this obsession with when is the moment of death, goes through so many of his stories. In the case of M. Valdemar, a man is hypnotised. This was a new thing in the 1800s. He's hypnotised, he's mesmerised, so that the point of death never quite comes. He's constantly on that point of death. And then when he's released, his body just crumbles, you know. And this is an obsession. He writes many stories, there's comic stories. There's one where a woman's head is chopped off and the head is still thinking as it rolls away down the gutter. And this kind of fascinated me, you know, this, this obsessive nature of Poe, the way he keeps thinking about the line between sanity and insanity and the line between life and death. And that's what powers so many of his best stories.
he wrote a lot of different kind of stories. He's famous for inventing the detective novel. That's, you know, sometimes disputed, but I think he did. He wrote uh, adventure stories. He wrote sort of comic stories. He wrote sort of philosophical duologues. So he didn't just write mystery stories. And some of his best stories, actually, are not lurid and horrific, but are actually quite subtle. I like The Oval Portrait very much. The Man in the Crowd is one of my favourite stories of his, which is simply about a man in, an 18th, in a 19th century London tea house, and he looks out across the, the crowds, and he sees one man who looks like he has a secret, and he follows him through the crowds in London throughout the whole of the day, but he never finds out the man's secret. It's a very simple story, but it's haunted me most of my life, and I like it more and more as I get older. But if you've never read Poe, he really is... the be You know, this is where... It, begins and ends. The mystery story, the ghost story, the macabre story, begins and ends with Edgar Allan Poe. In terms of ghost stories, well, we have to start with M.R. James. Look at this wonderful edition with a, a painting by Caspar David Friedrich on the front. This was my uh, M.R. James volume of choice for many years until I replaced it with this complete ghost stories from Oxford World Classics. Um, I kind of prefer the previous cover. Now, M.R. James, he gives you the ghost story par excellence uh, without any messing about. You know, it's very simple. Some, you know, academic or some fusty old, you know, librarian discovers some old book, some occult, with occult power. And once he's discovered it, some fiend comes after them, some horrible ghoul comes after them to take their life. And pretty much all the stories have that format. They're not subtle in terms of, you know, in terms of their literary style or in terms of their ambition or formal ambition. They are straightforward ghost stories. And that actually is their strength. That's their charm. James wrote them as amusements for his students. Uh, he was an Oxbridge Don, uh, quite a conservative Oxbridge Don by all accounts. And he just wrote these as a Christmas. He used to gather the students together in his study at Christmas and used to tell them ghost stories. And it's actually their simplicity and their, their cleanness that is actually their strength. James was a very um, brilliant antiquarian himself, so he knows of what he speaks. And he really brings us into that wonderful, fusty old world of the university library or the church archive. You know, it's a great setting for these stories. And his ghouls are relentless. You know, there's nothing nice about them. There's nothing subtle about them. They just want your blood. And... Uh, I still think he's the master of the straightforward ghost story. But he wasn't original. Ghost stories had been around for quite a long time. Uh, in Victorian England, they were immensely popular. I mean, Dickens wrote ghost stories. Later, Elizabeth Gaskell wrote ghost stories. Henry James wrote ghost stories. Before most of them came Sheridan Le Fanu, my favourite ghost story and macabre story writer, prior to uh, M.R. James. This is a rather un-ghostly cover by Atkinson Grimshaw. Very nice. I think it's meant to represent the heroine of Carmilla, which I think is his single greatest contribution to the horror genre. And is one of the very few stories I've ever read um, that genuinely got to me and scared me, which is odd because it's written almost as a kind of fable. Uh, for those people who don't know Carmilla, it's regularly... Uh, it's the it's the lesbian vampire story, right, where a female vampire preys on this young woman in a castle uh, in Middle Europe, and it's written in this kind of unreal world. This castle is in its remote castle, surrounded by a forest. This kind of aristocratic world, but but the way Le Fanu writes his prose is fantastic. He's a real wordsmith. Um, it's very sort of particular and fussy in the way that so much 19th century writing is, but it's also very beautiful. And there are scenes in Carmilla and in his best stories like Green Tea, which stay with you, they haunt you. There's one scene in Carmilla where the heroine wakes up in the middle of the night and she sees this girl who's her friend. She's crouched on the floor like a little dog looking up at her. I've never forgotten that as long as I live. It's one of the great moments in horror fiction. Um, and uh, I think Le Fanu is a brilliant writer, uh, a true master of the ghost story and of the, of the macabre. 
My favourite weird story writer uh, is a Welsh writer called Arthur Mackin, often called the British H.B. Lovecraft. Now, when I first started getting into Arthur Mackin, um, none of his stuff was in print. This was in the early 90s. You could not find Arthur Mackin in print. Now, there's a whole industry of Arthur Mackin novels. So when I started getting into Mackin, it, there was a joy, not just in reading his work, but in finding it. I used to comb second-hand bookshops for books like this. This is my uh, original edition of The Three Imposters, which is my favourite work by Arthur Mackin. It's a wonderful novel, which is made up of different stories, like, like a portmanteau horror film, like an amicus horror film. And um, there's a brilliant overarching story about these this group of uh, almost like terrorists, like sort of spooky terrorists spreading devilish things through the world. And then there's in, in, interspersed stories. Um, for those people who've just read the stories, you really should try reading the novel because uh, it actually it accentuates the terror of it and the strangeness of it. So I used to collect these things from second-hand bookshops. I loved Mac and I really fell in love with his work. And there was something special about finding these books, you felt like you were part of a special club, you know, because um, they weren't readily available. But now Mackin is widely available. This is my Tartarus Press edition of his uh, stories, and it's not the only one I have. Mackin is a weird story writer. He doesn't write about ghosts. He doesn't write about horror. He writes about a modern world which is invaded by spirits and gods of the past. And that's why he's been linked very much to Lovecraft, who I'll talk about in a minute. And I prefer him to Lovecraft, possibly because he's British and the mythology he's talking about is closer to me. But, but I think it's because Mackin's books are very straightforward and simple and cleanly written, with a bit of purple prose. But they really get to you. Um, one of my favorite stories is about this guy. He goes to his local chemist, he's got a bit of a flu. And the chemist is a bit short-sighted and he gives him some powder from this uh, flask that he shouldn't have touched. And actually it's the devil's wine. And this bloke starts to deteriorate and decompose into a monster. <laughs> it's great fun. Um, I think it's called the white powder, the story. And what I like about Mackin is, though his books are very simple and cleanly told, there's a sort of weird passion in them, as if he really believes what he's writing about. And that's what really caught my imagination. And um, if you've never read Mackin before, uh, I strongly recommend it. The Great God Pan, The Three Imposters, um, they are books that are well worth tracking down. They are beautiful works of the macabre. But I mentioned Lovecraft, so we've got to talk about him. Here he is, this is my big compilation of his stories, Necronomicon, wonderful name, isn't it? Look at that great big black tome. It's kind of like the book you get in horror movies that, you know, the villain finds some secret, secret, terrible secret about the world. In fact, it's a group of stories by an American writer writing in the early part of the 20th century, who by all accounts was a rather rum individual, but we won't go into that. Um, much admired by all sorts of people. Michel Houellebecq, the French novelist, is a great admirer of H.P. Lovecraft. I like Lovecraft very much. I actually find his mythology of Cthulhu, these ancient octopoid gods that are trying to come back and take over the world, I find that a bit of a bore. And it, it means that all his stories always come back, you know, to this kind of same starting point, which I find a bit depressing. But I love the way he writes. He's a very intense writer, a very feverish writer. It's like a sort of drug-induced dream reading. Lovecraft, and I think that's what so many people admire about his work. And I do love the intensity and the feel of his writing. I just wish I liked the mythology more. He seems to want to connect every single story into this Cthulhu mythos, which gets on my nerves after a while. But it has to be mentioned. Another writer I feel duty bound to mention, though I'm the jury is still out for me on this writer, is a British writer called Robert Aikman. Now, it was a friend of mine who called me this writer to my attention, and we've had a long-standing dispute about how good Robert Aikman is. He really loves Robert Aikman. I'm not so sure. He said that what he liked about Aikman is no other writer has ever left him with the impression 
of a dream, of being trapped in a nightmare. And certainly, Aikman's stories are so odd, they're so strange, they don't seem to have any real point, so that you do feel like you're in some kind of nightmare. I have an issue with that, though. It seems to me that Aikman is almost being macabre and rather unpleasant for the sake of it. I don't really see the point of his stories sometimes. I suppose it doesn't need to have a point, but I don't know. And secondly, what I don't like about Aikman is that underneath all his weirdness is a rather Middle England, middle class, peevish, small-minded, narrow-minded idea about the world. His, 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 his stories feel like they're written by some rather irritated, you know, middle-brow civil servant in Northampton who doesn't like the world, doesn't like people, doesn't like women. And I find that a bit irritating about his work. But as a, as a major force in British uh, macabre writing, you can't ignore him. This collection, Cold Hand in Mind, collects together three of my favourite Aikman stories, um, namely The Real Road to the Church, which I love but Aikman fans don't tend to like, The Hospice and The Same Dog. The Hospice has actually been filmed by ITV in the 1980s. Um, so the jury's still out for Aikman, but I thought he was worth mentioning. Before I finish this video, I want to recommend two writers of macabre stories who are less well known, but I think should be better known. The first is Algernon Blackwood, who was writing in the 20s and 30s. Blackwood, I think, is one of the most beautiful writers in the medium, superb prose. And he wrote two of the best macabre stories in the English language. One is called The Willows, and the other is called The Wendigo. Now, they're quite unusual, and Blackwood is quite unusual, because both of these stories are set in the great outdoors. One is set in the, the, the rivers and tributaries of this delta system in Germany, and the other is set in the Canadian forests. So they're not set in traditional places like haunted houses or Gothic graveyards, which may put some people off. And at first, I, was, I didn't really know how this was going to work, but I, I can tell you now, those two, those two stories have stayed with me more than most macabre stories I've read. They are expert works of literature, really beautiful. The Wendigo, I think Lovecraft actually said the Wendigo was the best macabre story in the English language, and he might be right about that. It's an extraordinary piece of work. It is, it's, it's almost mythical, rather than like a horror story, but it's also deeply moving. And, um, and it's got a, a fantastic visionary feel about it. I don't want to spoil the story, um, but if you've never read Algernon Blackwood, do find his stories, and particularly The Willows and The Wendigo. Um, the Willows is inspired so much, it's, it's inspired a very good CD, actually, by an electronic artist called Belbury Polly. Um, it's well worth tracking down if you like weird, macabre and electronic music, 80s style. And finally, I'd just like to mention L.T.C. Rolt, who I think was a friend and colleague of uh, Robert Aitman's, who helped him set up the Canal Trust, um, looking after Britain's canals and the history of the canals. Rolt is quite an interesting character in the ghost story world, because he sets all of his ghost stories in the world of the Industrial Revolution, by which I mean he sets them in the world of everyday industry, not in haunted houses or aristocratic settings, but down mines, on canals, on railways. Um, he had an interest in, you know, British industrial architecture and the world of the Industrial Revolution. And that's where he sets all his stories, and it gives them a unique quality and unique character. They're much more down-to-earth than a lot of these writers I've spoken about, yet they're still extremely effective. Um, uh, I, I've read a story called The Mine on my channel, and uh, you can check that out uh, once you've seen this video. And uh, I really recommend this little volume. If you've never heard of it, track it down. It's an interesting alternative to the usual ghost story. Well, they're the writers of the ghost story in the macabre that I particularly like, but I'd love to hear from you if there are others that you particularly value or that I should check out. Um, those are the ones that I most like, but there are plenty of other great ghost story writers. Of course, one of the best ghost stories of all time is Charles Dickens' The Signalman. 
and The Monkey's Paw. But um, those are my favourite writers. Let me know your writers and what you think of the writers I've chosen. Thanks very much.